my attention. So yeah, welcome uh, everyone. My name is Borja Santos and I'm the pleasure to be your tutor. Um, with us, uh, Camille already has spoken from IECA, from the Institute of Conflict and Humanitarian Affairs. And, and actually at the end of the presentation, we will have another guest, Silvia De Benito from Alianza por la Solidaridad, who will speak from, from an organization, from the experience of an organization. And Onah Aitken, uh, who comes from uh, Voluntary Europe, and she will tell us her testimony. So I think it's an amazing panel. Uh, we'll be speaking for maybe 30 minutes. And after that, we'll have space for questions. So as you can see, most probably here on the presentation, we are going to follow that. Let's watch first. Um, we are going to watch a video uh, of... Um, okay. We are going to watch a video of, uh, of, uh, of some examples that sometimes illustrate much better with the images uh, what, even, uh, what the EU volunteers is. So, yes. We can't hear, uh, Marja. Borja, I'm sorry, the, the sound quality is uh, really poor, so okay, okay. So let's, uh, maybe you can just uh, explain a little bit uh, more about, uh, about the, the video and uh, I explained in the chat that uh, we have uh, embedded uh, this, uh, this video in lesson one. Okay, perfect. Uh, sorry guys, about uh, that. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's actually a video of Maria Teresa who, um, who is a well, well volunteer for Aria. Who was in Haiti uh, doing some community work, especially with women. Uh, so she was explaining a little bit her her her, well, her role uh, during that time. And uh, although I think most of you are coming from host organizations uh, in this webinar, but it's, it's useful to know closer the experiences of, of some volunteers. So you will have three videos actually uh, in the first class. Uh, well, probably more, uh, but. Uh, these three will show you different experiences and, and it's good sometimes to put faces and, and to, to have an image of what you can expect from, from here. Um, oops, one second. Uh, can you see the presentation? Camille? Yes. Okay, so why, why, why this initiative? Why European uh, Union Aid Initiative? So, I think, main, I think it was main, mainly due to two reasons. The first of all is because um, this, uh, disasters, and, and, and especially caused by natural hazards, have created a lot of losses, uh, not only in terms of people's lives, but also in terms of displacement. So as you can see here in the screen, uh, just in the last 20 years, uh, natural hazard has caused the displacement of 4,000 million people. So uh, this reality also somehow contrasts with, um, with uh, what joined us uh, today in the European Union. I mean, as you, you, you are seeing on, on, on the race of different political parties are raising something that is very fundamental, like what, what is joining us, the different European countries? What do we have in common? Is, is it worth still to be together? And I think one of the main things that um, highlight our identity as an European is our values. Uh, and one 
of the most important European values is solidarity. So when somehow we mix this reality of the losses and causes of, of natural hazards, and at the same time, the European values of solidarity, uh, so we have this new initiative uh, that was born in 2010, the EU Aid Volunteer Initiative, that is what we are explaining today, and, and it will be explained further in the course that you are starting today. So it was piloted in 2014, and since then, uh, it was created the EU Aid Volunteer. So the timeline for more or less, it, it started officially in 2015, and is up to uh, 2020. So um, the program has a budget of almost 150 million euros, and that funds uh, the deployment of volunteers, but also a lot of capacity and training, and a little bit of uh, network and communication. So this activity, for example, is part of that building capacity and training of, of the EU volunteer. The numbers expected is that 4,000 uh, volunteers will be deployed with the uh, organizations. Um, so with this goal, uh, the operational objectives of the initiative was to increase the capacity of the EU to provide humanitarian aid, in this case through the volunteers, but also training the humanitarian European organizations, to have some coherence and consistency of volunteering across member states. Uh, so the program gives the opportunities for US citizens to participate in humanitarian aid activities, but also somehow uh, uh, provide some consistency in how to do it, right, across the United States. Then, this initiative is based on the humanitarian aid principles, uh, not only in the values of solidarity but that we spoke before, but the European Union has signed a European consensus on humanitarian aid where they provide um, uh, humanitarian aid principles, and, and that for this initiative follows those principles. Um, then, um, as we will see later, it improves the skills, knowledge and competences of different volunteers uh, that will be deployed. And the most important for most of you as well, it builds the capacity of hosting organizations. And we are going to see how. So the capacity building component is some, what we are doing today is one example of that. And the opportunities for NGOs are uh, is basically to have volunteers deployed in your operations and to give you opportunity as well for hosting and for sending organizations to create synergies and create alliances between organizations and we will see how. Uh, fostering partnerships, that's what we said before, and uh, giving opportunities for volunteers. Uh, when we talk about humanitarian aid, um, something that you will understand much better during the course because we will learn about this, but we, uh, the initiative, what it offers is that in, in places where they are experiencing a vulnerable situation, a humanitarian situation, the volunteers will not only participate directly on an emergency response, that sometimes might be even uh, difficult because of the, of the circumstances, uh, but they will also participate in preparedness and disaster risk reduction activities. What that means? So they will work on development activities that will try to reduce the risk that uh, humanitarian situations would cause uh, high losses in the future. So we have three main uh, uh, agencies somehow in this initiative. On one side, the European Commission. The European Commission. The European Commission set up the priorities areas for the deployment and we will explain during the course the links and where you can find all the information that provides the European Commission. The European Commission as well has a digital platform, an IT platform, where you can see all the deployment of volunteers and the offers, the job offers. And finally, obviously, they provide the funding resources for this. Then we have the sending and the hosting organization. The sending, when we call the sending, we will see it later, but it's mainly the European organization. And the hosting organization can be the same one but working on, on, on a developing country or it can be another completely different organization that makes an alliance or a consortia with the same organization. So, and the final agency, we have the volunteers, those European uh, members of different age that get proper training through the initiative and will be deployed to work in a humanitarian situation. So we have these three main agencies in the initiative. What are the benefits for each of them? So obviously for the host community, uh, so the, 
Uh, the volunteer will be working on reinforcing the capacities and resilience of the vulnerable communities. So, for example, in the case of Maria Teresa in Haiti, she was working in the resource in, in vulnerable communities in Haiti. Right? So, the, the host community with the host organization and with the volunteer, they will work together on, on this. And uh, the idea is that uh, I mean, the work of the volunteer and the host organization will be an effort added to uh, minimize the losses of lives and damages when these places, these communities experience uh, natural hazards. The benefits for the civil society organizations are that suddenly, I mean, they will have a pool of network that are well trained, that although they are volunteers, they will be well trained and they will be carefully selected based on their skills. And they will be ready for actions for uh, an amount of time. Two months, six months, we will see the different amount of time that the volunteers are usually deployed. Um, they will, I mean, also the civil society organizations will be able to develop and build humanitarian response capacity, not only with the volunteers as well, but, but with the training that they are receiving, with the networks that they are building, and so on. And uh, something that we will see later and that will be interesting for you as well. If you are a sending organization, if you would like to create a consortium with another host organization in the field and you would like to deploy volunteers, what do you need to be eligible? So you need to uh, adhere to the standards and procedures of the EU aid volunteer initiative. Uh, you need to be active in the humanitarian field, so you need to show that you work in this kind of environment. And you need to be either a non-governmental, non-profit organization established in the EU, as a, uh, in one of the EU member states, or you should be a civilian public law body from a member state uh, referred in the Article 23. During the training, the first actually model will be about these kind of things, and we will explain further where you can find links where they explain better information of how to be eligible or not, but that we will clarify more. Uh, later, in case you have any issues. And the International Federation of the Rest Process. Uh, for the volunteers, as you might imagine, the benefits are that they will have an opportunity to get involved in humanitarian aid. I mean, volunteers might have different goals. They might have, you might find volunteers who want to build a career in this sector. So being a volunteer for the EU is a first time experience somehow for many of them. But you will have other senior professionals that somehow they have a another job, but they want to put their skills for a, for a period of time in a humanitarian context. And uh, that profile is also interesting because you bring a professional skills and senior skills in, into, into your humanitarian work. Uh, and for them, obviously, it's a unique learning experience uh, where they put their hands on, on and, deliver and work with professional, professional humanitarian workers. Um, as the other two videos that we couldn't see today, but uh, you will watch them during the training, will show uh, uh, this kind of unique learning experience that volunteers are experiencing. Um, process for organization. So how the process works. So the first step is to become eligible, right? Uh, to become eligible, you need to be, you need to certify. Your organization need to be certified. It's a relatively easy process that you need to do and you need to apply to a link that we will uh, offer you during the first model. And um, you need to basically uh, follow the different steps that the certification process requires. Uh, who needs to be certified? The sending organization, the organization from the EU, but also the hosting organization that you are going to work with if you have already identified that hosting organization previously. The second step, is you need to build a consortium between the sending organization and the hosting organization. So you need to build a partnership uh, and make it official uh, through, the, through the initiative. And once you are certified and you have built a consortium between sending and hosting organization, then you will call for proposal and you will open uh, vacancies for volunteers. So you will send uh, project proposals to the EU um, they, it will take some time, they will be accepted, and once they are accepted, the positions and vacancies for volunteers for your projects will be advertised in their platform. So this is more or less the, the process. What are the challenges that we have seen uh, through the experience? So one is that although the, the initiative provides funding to, for, the to, for the volunteers,
volunteers to be deployed and, and for those expenses. Uh, so the, the Sentinel hosting organization, they need to identify what are the needs assessments in, in the operation. Uh, and sometimes that requires a little bit of funding to identify, so what is required, what, are, what kind of specific skills are needed, or how long that person will be, how that person will be integrated. So sometimes organizations don't have that kind of funding and the needs assessment is, is done a little bit um, less professional sometimes and that might have some consequences and so sometimes the, the, the volunteer when it arrives require a little bit uh, more time it requires longer to adapt and to, to start working on the, on the issue so it's good to have this in mind that the needs assessment should be done professionally uh, then um, yeah there are differences between human resources uh, and between the organizations so sometimes the capacity for recruitment to deliver or to prepare the facilities and logistics for the volunteer so they might differ so it's difficult sometimes to to be homogeneous on this and it depends on the organization and the capacities and then something that is a challenge as well is that the volunteers they require a little bit of coaching many of them they might have really good skills but they might have not worked in a humanitarian context so they need a little bit of coach from the sending previously and from the host organization some of the lesser learns that we had is that it's very important when you will select the volunteer and even when you will design uh, the position to have to involve the local partners and uh, that are gonna work that's very important. Sometimes because hurries or because different things, the sending organization manage all this process, but it's very good, even if it's a little bit slower, to involve the local partner and to work together on the needs. Um, well, it's an excellent initiative, something that we have learned. It's an excellent initiative to promote European values of solidarity, because in many occasions, actually, the volunteers, the EU volunteers, they work not alone in the field, they work with another European volunteer. Sometimes they realize that uh, an Italian, Spanish, German, Polish person, what they have in, more in common is, is those values. Uh, so it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful um, highlight and, and experience. Um, another point that uh, another lesson learned is that when you uh, will work on the recruitment of volunteers, focus on the skills needed. This is very important. And the skills needed should be in many cases related with disaster. So you need to identify the skills that are needed in this kind of department. Um, and something that has been also very interesting uh, for this initiative is that the EU needs agile mechanism to deploy people. Uh, so this has been a, a very good instrument for this kind of matter, for this kind of uh, goal, to, to have another instrument for the European Union Commission that deploy um, volunteers uh, rapidly. So you can see, for example, a map of, it's not completely updated, but just in 2016 and 2017, where the volunteers were deployed and where actually the sending organizations and um, was working with host organizations in which countries. And you can see it's very diverse. We have countries in South America, Africa, Middle East, and, and Asia. So more or less the key figures to summarize um, the, the numbers of the initiative. So as we mentioned earlier, um, the EU e volunteer initiative received 150 million uh, for, for funding and 400 volunteers are expected to be deployed at the end of this year. And so far we have 145 certified organizations. So in the previous three years, we have had already many different organizations moving forward and getting certified. So it, there is already a a historic experience on, on, on this, how to manage this. So I hope more or less this brief uh, synopsis is relatively clear. Just to remind you that you are starting a course with um, uh, in the platform and you probably have already had access to it. And you will see there that the first class is about, is, is it provides further instructions on, on how the EU aid volunteer initiative works, how you can be certified, how you will deploy the volunteer, so maybe you have some questions today, but definitely they will be more clarified once you read and get trained on this content. And to provide a little bit more testimony and more experiences, uh, I have the pleasure to invite Silvia de Benito, who works in Alianza por la Solidaridad. She can provide a testimony of the initiative 
and she is a junior officer on, on this initiative. So Silvia, are you there? Hello, Borja. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. Okay, thank you uh, for giving me the floor. So as Borja said, uh, I am working for Alianza por la Solidaridad. Uh, most of you know me uh, through our exchange of emails, and I am very happy to have all of you here taking part in this uh, induction webinar. We hope it will be useful for you to have a taste of the course that's launching today. And uh, so as Camille explained in the beginning, this is the third edition uh, of the online course dedicated to introducing the EU Aid Volunteers Initiative to organizations of the European Union. Um, so first, I would like to explain a little bit why we have organized this course, uh, where, it, where it is coming from and where we are trying to, to get, what's the aim. So um, this course has been organized in the framework of uh, one technical assistance project uh, that Alianza is organizing together with other um, partner organizations. Two of them are uh, with us today here. We have Marco from ActionAid Italia, and we have Ona and Caris from Volunteer Europe. So together with uh, some other organizations, we created a consortium uh, to apply for a technical assistance project. Uh, this way we can benefit from funding of the EU to, um, on the one hand, uh, prepare some organizations to get their certification. And on the other hand, uh, the, the EU funds also allow already certified organizations to keep improving our internal mechanisms, procedures, etc., cetera, et cetera, um, so that we, uh, yeah, so that we improve um, ourselves, how we can uh, select volunteers, how we can manage them, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, um, so this is one example of what uh, technical assistance uh, means for EU organizations, right? So there's uh, in this case today we are trying to raise awareness about the initiative, uh, give you information as much as possible, and uh, yeah. Um, so this is uh, a test for you. I hope that you will be interested in the in the initiative and also perhaps you can start considering whether you would like to become certified um, and uh, perhaps start to assess in your organization. So Alianza was one of the first uh, organizations to get involved with the EU Aid Volunteers Initiative. In 2012, uh, we participated in the pilot phase uh, we sent three volunteers and overall it was a good experience. So when uh, the framework was created in 2014, Alianza didn't think it twice and uh, decided to apply for the first deployment projects. So we sent our application in 2016 and the first volunteers were deployed in early 2017. So as you can see, uh, this is still a quite recent uh, initiative. So uh, our SOAPs from in Alianza, we are still learning how to how to do things. Uh, we are trying to continuously improve our internal policies, and uh, in general, we have um, we have very good relations with the two uh, EU bodies. Uh, that are managing the initiative. You will see uh, more in depth during the online course who is managing it. But on the one hand, we have uh, DG Echo, and on the other hand, we have an agency. Uh, it's called EAC. It's well, it's a long name. Um, we call it EACA. <laughs> so um, this year, uh, they carried out the first uh, midterm evaluation of the initiative. As you saw, the framework was um, envisaged from 2015 until 2020. So this year they decided to carry out a midterm evaluation to see how things uh, were progressing with the deployment of volunteers. And um, 
in this case, uh, the organizations could also give their feedback to, to the EU. Um, so it's also very positive that we can, um, uh, yeah, we can explain what we have been doing, what challenges we're experiencing. So for sending organizations, um, as Borja explained, the first thing that uh, we need to do is to get certified in order to take part in the initiative. Um, currently, there are 17 standards, and I think we can divide them in three different budgets or clusters. So um, on the one hand, there is five standards dealing with uh, internal procedures and policies of the organizations. And uh, they are mainly uh, they are mainly dealing with safety and security of the volunteers when they are deployed in in the third country with your uh, partner hosting organization. A second cluster of standards has to do with the management of volunteers. Uh, so that would be everything um, to do with selection, identification of volunteers. Um, data protection policy, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, there's a third cluster of standards um, dealing with um, the monitoring and assessment of the volunteers and their work. So um, certification can be, I mean, uh, one organization can decide to, to apply for certification. This is an ongoing call. So uh, any time of the year, you can decide to send your application through the uh, channels that are available online. Uh, there's going to be one module in the online course dedicated to uh, the process of submitting not only certification application, but also uh, the funding application to deploy volunteers. So you will see that we will deal with this um, more in depth during the course. Um, so I think the last thing I would like to, to say now is that uh, technical assistance is, yeah, so technical assistance projects are available for EU organizations uh, either from the very beginning. So if you, if you, think, if you see that you're not uh, able to, to prepare yourselves on your own for this process, you can join a consortium uh, of organizations and uh, you, you will benefit from different um, different activities, internal processes such as self-assessment uh, to see where your organization stands uh, or you can try to apply for certification directly and then if it's uh, rejected then you can try to uh, apply for funding for technical assistance. Um, so the last thing, <laughs> the second last thing before I give the floor back is that, uh, as I said, today we are uh, launching this activity in the framework of one technical assistance project called PLUS Care. And um, I would like to let you know that uh, in addition to this online course, which is general, uh, it's providing general information about the initiative, we will organize uh, on a later stage uh, another online course dedicated to the 17 certification standards. It's going to be more specific and more tailor-made to organizations. So among all the participating organizations to, to the course now, we will select one uh, organization per country to participate on the second training. So you can already start thinking if you would like to, to continue with the, with, the, with the training and, uh, and you can let us know at the, at the end of this course. So I think this is everything for now. I'm giving you, uh, I'm giving the, back, the floor back to Borja. Thank you very much, Silvia, for the excellent um, uh, testimony and, and the instructions that you have provided. You have provided. Um, I think our next skip, skip, uh, speaker is uh, Ona Aitken. 
Uh, is she with us? Do you know Sylvia? Is she also in? Yes, Ona and Paris are here. Uh, hello, Ona, can you hear us? Do I need, do you know the username? Hello. Hello, yeah, we can hear you. Oh, good, okay. Um, so, hello everyone. Um, I, I, I've been asked just to say a bit about the involvement of uh, Volunteer and Volunteering Matters in the EU Aid Volunteer Programme. So, I'll, I'll try and just give you a very quick snapshot of um, our, our work in this, uh, in this Technical Assistance Consortium. So, um, as you can see from the slide, um, I'm the Chief Executive of Volunteering Matters. Volunteering Matters is a national charity in the United Kingdom. We provide innovative volunteer-led solutions to problems that vulnerable individuals, families and communities might have. Um, and we characterise our volunteering as transformative. So it transforms the life of the beneficiary and it transforms the life of the volunteer. So you can perhaps see why we were interested in EU aid volunteers because it really fits with our mission, vision and values. Um, the other hat I'm wearing today is as president of Volunteer Europe. And Volunteer Europe is a network of 70 plus organisations across Europe, across the EU and beyond. Um, and it's all about organisations that currently work with volunteers. So vol organisations that are very similar to uh, Volunteering Matters. Um, and we got involved as Volunteer Europe because I guess we felt that um, we had quite a lot to offer in terms of our experience of um, managing volunteers, of recruiting volunteers, of giving them support and training in a consistent way. Um, we also do a lot of work around risk management for volunteers and safeguarding volunteers. So again, it, it all fits very well with what you've heard um, from, from Sylvia and from Borja this morning. Um, we've been working with, uh, in the consortium that Alianza leads uh, for quite a while now. Um, it's a really interesting experience for us both as the, the, the hosts and the managers of a European network, but also as a, as a volunteer organisation in the UK. Um, and we have in a kind of um, schizophrenic way um, been working on the technical assistance with Alianza, but also preparing ourselves as volunteering matters to be a sending organisation. Um, we're also particularly interested in the kind of capacity that we might offer a, a hosting organisation um, in terms of all the things that are on the agenda for EU volunteers, but things like financial capacity, strategic planning, um, all of that kind of thing that you know, we have uh, 50 plus years of, of experience of here. But we also feel that we as Volunteer Matters and indeed as Volunteer could learn a huge amount from organisations that are looking yeah. for to use in, uh, in other countries and that are um, Oh, no, yeah, we can hear you. Also, there is some, although there is some noise. Yeah. Not from here because we are not. You don't have there. Okay, I'm, I'm checking it. Uh, find out from where. Mohon. Okay. Yes, it's done. Thank you. Um, so basically, that's that's the involvement that we've um, we've had with the program so far. Um, we're really excited about um, continuing to work with other organisations. So what we've done is we've. We've, through our Volunteer Europe network, we've um, been helping a number of organisations across Europe to prepare themselves for certification. So we've been, just as, as Sylvia said, we've been helping them with um, things like the, the standards around safety, the standards around volunteer recruitment and management, um, and all of that sort of, that sort of thing. 
Um, some of you may have met in the past um, Rosalind Dignan Pearson, who was our main contact uh, on this programme. Um, sadly, Rosalind has left the organisation and that's why Caris is here with me today because Caris is going to be taking over that aspect of the work um, and uh, the two of us, along with Piotr, who sadly can't be with us today because he's on holiday in Argentina. Lucky Piotr. Um, he, he, he and I and uh, Caris will be working very closely with Alianza on the programme in the future. Um, so that, that, that's really all I wanted to say about our involvement. Very happy if anybody's got any questions. Um, for, for, I would also just say in Borja, for participating organisations and Syria, um, there's a very good online course about humanitarian aid volunteering and humanitarian aid generally that I took some time ago. Um, and if people, have, if people have time to follow that course, it's very, very, it's very good and it's very interesting. And if you've never been involved in, in humanity and aid volunteering in the past, then it gives you a really good kind of insight into how that works and, and, and really increases your knowledge of it quite quickly. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much, Ona, for your testimony. It has been very, very uh, useful. Um, so now I think we have, um, some time for questions. What I would suggest, and well, the, the only thing is that you can see here the, um, the course and the platform where you will be entering and, and doing the course um, that provides you with five modules and we will have conversations in the, in the cafeteria, uh, which is in, in the platform. So I hope it's a, it's a very um, interesting experience for all of you. Uh, actually, Camille, ha Camille has uh, written the link in the chat of the group in case you didn't have it, but probably you, you, you should have received it so far by, by email. Um, so then, if you have any questions, the, the way we will organize ourselves is that if you can write them in the chat, uh, I guess you might have two different kind of questions. One that might be questions, some others that might be comments. So maybe you can start by writing uh, if it's a question or a comment, you can put it in, in capital letters. Uh, so we will answer those questions and maybe those comments, we will just highlight them uh, for, for information. So you can write them in the chat. Um, so in that way, we can organize us uh, better and we can respond. Uh, it can be Camille from IECA, it can be Silvia uh, from Alianza para Solidaridad, it can be Onah and, and her experience. Uh, I can uh, uh, reply as well any kind of questions you might have. And as Camille is saying in the chat, if you would have any technical matter during the course about password access, any kind of IT problems you have, you can contact uh, that email address that is in the chat, cursos at ieca.org. So we have a little bit of time for, for questions. Uh, so don't be shy. Or if you have any comment, uh, you heard about, about it before, this initiative, or how it looked like for you, if you think it's gonna bring you benefits for your organization, it might be very useful for others. So uh, I see that our participants are a bit shy this morning, Vodha. If I may, uh, I just for I forgot to say earlier that um, so uh, in addition to all the positive aspects that Borja highlighted already, uh, I would just wanted to say that uh, going through the process of uh, certification is also very good um, just to assess and improve your internal policies in the organization, everything that has to do with uh, safety, security, uh, equal opportunities, data protection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I see we have a question now. Mm -hmm. How does this course works? I mean, we go in the chat by ourselves, so I think don't don't get confused with the chat of the Zoom. This is just a webinar. And uh, it will be finalized uh, today in a few minutes. So the course is in the link that Camille has provided a little bit before. And you will see 
in that platform will be like, like the screen that we are showing right now in the presentation. So in that platform, in that link, you need to register yourself. Probably you, have, you should have received uh, um, a user and a password from IECA. In case you didn't receive it, you should write and contact that address that is in the chat right now. And then once you get access, you enter in the platform, uh, get familiar with it. I mean, it's not complicated, it's, it's quite simple. So you can click in different moments, you can click and see the content. Already there are two classes there that you can start working on and you will do them by your own somehow, you will follow them by your own. And um, at the end, we will have an exam, kind of, well, more than an exam, a, a, a work, an assignment to finalize the course. But during every week, we will share information in the cafeteria. So also get uh, familiar with the cafeteria. It's an area, it's a photo, it's an area where we will provide some questions uh, about the different modules that you are uh, following every week. And we will qualify some questions. We will have a space for debating and for clarifying questions. So um, on one side, you have the, the presentations, the modules that you need to read. And on the other side, you have the cafeteria that you need to follow regularly because there will be very interesting content uh, to discuss uh, among colleagues. And finally, at the end, you will have uh, an assignment. And in the, in, I forgot to mention that actually, once you enter in the platform, you have a guideline, a guideline of how the platform works, how the course will work, uh, and you can also get access to that and read it. So I hope it's clear, Saberi. Great. So any other question? Come on. Thank you, Sylvia, for your for coming in. Don't forget that the classes are ready from today. So if you are ready, you can start uh, uh, accessing the platform. Um, I wrote a welcome message in the cafeteria and I will write another one uh, today or tomorrow presenting myself and I will ask you to introduce yourself. So it's good to know who are the colleagues in this workshop uh, and uh, actually uh, how much, how we will have a lot of experience actually in the cafeteria. Uh, so it will be very nice to, to enrich the debates with all the pers different perspectives. So, um, Mojo de Caña asks, in our organization, we are some people in international projects management. Can we add other participants to the training course? So maybe Camille, can you clarify this? If they can add other participants in the, uh, the yes. training course? The, the global policy for this uh, project is uh, one user per organization because uh, yeah we have some limitations and this is a uh, tutored uh, e-learning uh, yeah, as you had uh, the, the tutor Borja so we uh, we are not able to uh, to add more and more users so but what you can do is uh, to share the this user uh, with uh, with your colleagues so they can access the the lessons. Uh, we'll have five lessons during the, the e-learning. Uh, we've just uh, opened uh, the e-learning with the two lessons uh, about uh, the initiatives, the uh, EU Ed Volunteers uh, initiatives. And uh, we'll start the, the three um, last lessons about uh, humanitarian action uh, next week. So it could be interesting to, to share this uh, these contents, uh, these lessons with uh, with your colleagues. Uh, you can share the, the link or you can share the, the user and password. Uh, but uh, as uh, Borja explained, uh, we'll have a practical activity uh, during the, the e-learning. Uh, it's quite simple thing, but it's uh, just uh, the opportunity to to apply, to put into practice uh, the the contents uh, we'll uh, we'll see uh, in the in the lessons. And uh, for these reasons, we can't have more and more users because um, Borja is going to uh, control 
uh, review uh, all the all the practical exercises exercises and to give some feedback uh, in the in the closing uh, webinar and individual feedback uh, through emails at the end of the course so you can yes please do share uh, all the, the contents uh, the comments uh, in the forum in uh, through your organization but uh, for the certificate and uh, the practical activity uh, we um, we can't uh, have more and more users thank you Camille thank you Monjo for your question yeah very very important so any other comment or question before finalizing the, the webinar? Yes, Sylvia? Yeah, you can take the floor, definitely. Thank you. So uh, just before we close uh, the session today, I just wanted to let you know that for the uh, webinar at the end of the course, uh, where I imagine perhaps you will have more questions after going through the five modules, we will uh, have one former volunteer who will be able to explain uh, her experience. And we will also have uh, the expert in humanitarian aid of Alianza por la Solidaridad. Um, she has been working with uh, the deployed volunteers uh, in the different projects, so uh, perhaps she will be able to explain why the requirement about having experience in humanitarian aid and what it means for organizations. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Silvia. Thank you. So, I think without um, any other question, we can start closing the webinar. Just. Uh, one reminder, this presentation will be shared as well in the cafeteria in the course in case you want to check it or in case you want to share it with your colleagues. And I encourage you to introduce yourself um, in the cafeteria. I will send a message today uh, so we can somehow share our profiles and start with energy the course. And thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, all the participants. Uh, again, if you have any question, if it's technical, you can write the link that um, Camille sent here in the chat, courses at IECA.org. And if you have technical questions about the course and about um, humanitarian concepts, please don't hesitate to share it in the cafeteria. We will be, although your work is personal and you will be following, following personally every week the presentations, we have a, a common space where we can enrich our common learning. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Silvia. Thank you, Camille. Thank you, Ona, for your participation. And, and enjoy the course. Uh, thanks, Borja. Thanks, uh, everyone. Uh, we'll close uh, this uh, this webinar and as uh, Borja explained, uh, we'll share uh, all the all the contents in the in the course in the main forum, the cafeteria, and uh, enjoy the course. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sylvia.